Good afternoon. Uh, I appreciate the opportunity to speak at this very, very important conference. And I ask the question, following Dr. Monto, where do these pandemics come from? And the answer is before you. They come from the migratory waterfowl of the world, uh, particularly the ducks and geese families and the shorebird families. There are 16 families of influenza viruses that live in these aquatic birds of the world. And that's where all of the pandemics come from. There are two things about these wild birds. They don't observe borders. So they don't have to get permission to enter a country and do good or bad. They come in and they bring with them the influenza. The other point about influenza in the wild birds, it is not a respiratory infection. It replicates in the intestines. And as these birds migrate, they poop it into the water. And from time to time, it transmits to other species. So if we look at the 16 families, so far we've seen influenza H1, H2, H3 that have occurred in humans. The rest have not occurred or caused pandemics in humans. Uh, the white color means that they've been productive, they've affected both humans and pigs. The black is they've tried it on in pigs but haven't established what we call a lineage. Of the other members of the 16, H5 and H7 are extremely bad in domestic poultry. They can become killers and kill 100% of your chickens or turkeys in a matter of days. And these have both tried it on in humans and pigs, but once again, they haven't yet succeeded in moving successfully to humans, and the same with H9. So these pandemics that uh, Arnold was talking about, we now know where they came from. The pandemic, the 1918 pandemic, that he, he told you, this is the granddaddy of all pandemics to date, between 20 and 50 million persons in the world, is a recombinant between a duck virus and a human virus, getting some of their gene segments that he talked about from the duck and some from the human. We know even more about the Asian. We know how many gene segments that came from the duck. Three of the eight, the hemagglutinin, neuraminidase, the spike glycoproteins, and the PB1 from the duck virus, and the rest from humans, and similarly for the Hong Kong pandemic. I just want to spend a moment talking about the Spanish flu give you one incident. So we're looking at the map of Alaska. In 1918, there was a quarantine put on all ships uh, entering port. Uh, the mail ship was going into Nome, and there was apparently no influenza on board. So they unloaded the mail and gave it to the letter carrier on his dog sled. And the dog sled driver headed towards Brevig Mission. And unfortunately, influenza, 1918 influenza was on the ship. And the dog sled driver took sick on the way, but the dog sled brought the sled into Brevig Mission. And this is what happened at Brevig Mission between the 15th and the 20th. 72 of the 80 people died. That's how severe 1918 could be. And this is primary virus infection. 
and that the, the, the illustrates what a severe pandemic it could be. Interestingly, it was the children that survived. We have all been extremely interested in this 1918 because we didn't, it wasn't stored in deep freezes, we didn't know what it made it pathogenic. So Jeffrey Taubenberger uh, started sequencing samples that the Armed Forces Institute had stored in Washington and ran out of samples. And Johan Hulton went back to Brevig Mission, dug up one of the people who had died and provided sufficient material to, for Jeffrey Taubenberger to obtain the total sequence of the 1918. Then, using reverse genetics, we, the virus was resynthesized from chemicals in the laboratory. This is one of the first cases where a virus has been created from the basic nucleotides. And using this reverse genetic system, the sequence provided by Jeffrey Taubenberger was used to make up the various gene segments. We use it to make vaccines, but the point is we can now make an influenza virus knowing the primary sequence. So we use it for making vaccines uh, for the currently for H5N1 and for the future by modifying the hemagglutinin and neuraminidase, putting it into cells and making the virus. So this is a potential two-armed sword. When that virus was remade and put into macaque monkeys uh, in the uh, high quarantine lab in Canada by Kawoka and his colleagues, the virus was path highly pathogenic in macaque monkeys with high virus loads, aberrant cytokines from the innate response, severe primary pneumonia, and death. The nine macaques had to be put down, showing that this virus was resynthesized from re recreated, whereas in comparison, a human virus, H1N1, caused little or nothing to the pig and to humans. But to move an influenza virus from the bird to mammal means that many different changes have to be made. Because in the avian species, the, the bird is at 42 degrees, very high temperature. The virus is replicating in the intestine. It's fecal waterborne. It has different receptors. And all of these changes have to take place 42 to 37, intestinal respiratory, and so on, to move a virus across. So it's not going to happen very frequently. It's going to take many molecular changes for an avian virus to become a mammalian virus. And the pig provides the optimal conditions. The pig has a body temperature of 39, and the site of replication can be either the intestine or the respiratory tract, and it converts the virus to respiratory infection. So when we think about swine and swine influenza, it was in 1918, the virus that Dr. Monto talked about went into, came from the wild birds and humans, went into pigs, and from 1918 to 1998, the virus in the pigs of the Americas and the rest of the world was antigenically stable and became more and more benign until it was almost innocuous. And we talk about the monogamous period where the virus was very stable. Then in 1998, something happened. And the thing that happened some new gene segments came from the wild birds 
into the pigs, and that virus from then on became, began reassorting uh, with other viruses in the world. And the virus we talk about became very promiscuous. And then the virus, the, the so-called 2009 pandemic appeared. And we can now trace each of the gene segments. This is our influenza virus that Arnold showed you. Each of these gene segments would take the uh, green hemagglutinin spike. It came from the ducks. Every one of the components come from the duck. So we know with certainty now that influenza pandemics come from the wild aquatic birds. That virus spread remarkably quickly across the world, thanks to uh, air travel and also the transmissibility of the virus. It transmitted extremely rapidly. Uh, at least 6,000 people, 6,000 deaths occurred in the first six months. Additionally, the virus has gone back to pigs, turkeys, cats, dogs, and ferrets. Very, very transmissible virus. But it was not nearly as pathogenic as the 1918. And it's useful to compare the current pandemic with the 1918 pandemic, and this is the disaster pandemic. The yield in human airway cells is 50 times what the current pandemic was. The virus grew much, much more. When we look at the genomics of the virus, it was structurally almost identical. Receptor binding, it binds to the same receptors. It did not have the same internal high pathogenic potential in the polymerase genes which lets the virus replicate. And bacterial co-infection was prevalent in 1918, less prevalent now. Let's turn briefly to H5N1. H5N1 uh, is an avian influenza virus. It emerged in 1996 in southern China. It spread to over 60 countries, and over 500 million poultry have been destroyed. And currently, 564 human cases, 330 deaths. This was a really scary virus with the potential to kill more than 50% of those that got infected. Fortunately, this virus is not like the pandemic H1N1. It has not learned to, to transmit human to human. But if it did, it would be a terrible disaster. What has happened is the H5N1 has not gone away. It's established in multiple epicenters in the world. This virus started in southern China, and probably in Hong Kong. Uh, it, we first picked it up in the live poultry markets. Presumably the ducks brought it in, mixed the genes in the, uh, the chickens, and the, when children came into the markets, the virus transmitted to them. This virus has now, I've already pointed out, killed over 50% of the, of, of the humans that's infected. It has stayed in Eurasia. One of the surprising features is it has not transmitted with the, world, with the migratory waterfowl to the Americas. We don't understand why it hasn't done so. Uh, maybe this is such a lethal virus that in the, the duck, it, the duck does not migrate, or some reason that we don't fully understand. It hasn't made it to the New World or to Australia. However, this virus is still very active. There are currently many clades or many families 
It has continued to evolve, and we now have 12 different clades, and these are the main clades that are in existence at the moment. The original clade is still in Southeast Asia. The one that is of greatest worry to me is clade 2.3.2. Clade 2.3.2 has gone back into the wild bird population. And if this virus is being transmitted through the duck to the next generation, God help us because it will have the potential to be reintroduced again and again into the poultry of Korea and elsewhere. So that is the great worry. So looking to the future, we have to improve biosecurity. The statement is with these viruses to control the influenza, keep it out or stamp it out, don't vaccinate it out because you will not succeed properly. We also have to understand the burden of influenza in swine, which we have been not doing very thoroughly. We should have known that the current pandemic was in pigs and we hadn't picked it up. Virological surveillance in Hong Kong showed that the virus did not come out of Asia, but it came out of Mexico. The future, we hope that in the future, by understanding the genomics of influenza viruses from the wild birds, we may be able to make predictions. That's our hope in the long future. The other thing we have to keep in mind is this is now one world. One world for influenza in the wild bird, the problems in the poultry, the veterinary world, and humans. In other words, the whole system is coming together. And with that possibility of a disaster if H5N1 makes it. This slide summarizes my concern about H5N1. Here's the riders of the apocalypse saying, that guy gives me the creeps, and that's H5N1. If it makes it, we are in deep doo-doo. And just in conclusion, to link back to some of the other topics, in a recent paper in Science, uh, earthquake experts in Italy were tried for manslaughter, uh, and I don't know if they were convicted or not, uh, for calling a mild earthquake. The earthquake became, was much more severe, mm -hmm. so now they're being tried for manslaughter. Mm -hmm. When we turn back to pandemics, I don't think we're ever going to be able to forecast a mild pandemic. And as Arnold pointed out, that's one of the problems with pandemics is they can be mild, they can be severe. We, as scientists, are almost forced to call them um, or plan for the worst and hope for the best. I just like to acknowledge my institution, St. Jude, and the many people in the world, including WHO, colleagues in Korea, Dr. Choi, who participated in these studies, my colleagues in Hong Kong, and the colleagues in Alberta, Canada, on the wild bird studies. And this is my institution. Thank you for your attention.